Is Apple's new M1 Max chip really that much faster than the new M1 Pro? I ran a bunch of benchmark tests where we run the same test on a bunch of different computers to see if it really makes a difference. So in these new MacBook Pros, 14 inch, which is a new screen size for Apple and the 16 inch, you can get them with either of Apple's new chips, the M1 Pro and the M1 Max. Those are both better than the regular M1, which uh, we started seeing in the MacBook Air and the 13 inch MacBook Pro and the 24 inch iMac and the Mac mini last year, but they did not have a lot of graphics power to them. And that's what Creative Pros have been looking for because they used to get, let's say, a Mac or a Windows system with an Intel CPU and an Nvidia or an AMD GPU. On Macs, you had your uh, Intel and AMD combinations on Windows, you could mix it up a lot more. On these new Macs, no more discrete graphics options. Everything is bundled into that M1 chip. So the M1 Pro, you can get uh, 14 or 16 GPU cores along with eight or 10 CPU cores. And on the M1 Max, you got the 10 CPU cores and you can get 24 or 32 GPU cores. So there's a lot of options within those and you can go into Apple's configurator and, and spec out your system anywhere from $2,000 to more than $6,000. Although a lot of that extra expense comes from RAM and storage, uh, not just upgrading the CPU. So when I reviewed the 14 inch and 16 inch MacBook Pros, I had a 14 inch with an M1 Pro and that was a 10 core CPU, 16 core GPU version. And I had a 16 inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Max and that was the 10 core CPU, 32 core GPU version. Now, in my initial testing, I didn't see a lot of daylight between those two chips and how they performed. That's partially because I'm frankly a fairly mainstream user. I do a little bit of video editing. I do some light 3D modeling. I play around in Photoshop and Illustrator a lot, but not so much that you would really push these new M1 chips. And frankly, I was fine with the regular M1 in the MacBook Air last year. I was able to do even the basic 4K editing I sometimes do in that in Premiere. So on these new systems, I ran the standard benchmarks we usually run, which are frankly very mainstream oriented. Geekbench, Cinebench, we took some high-res video files and we threw a bunch of color corrections and motion graphics on them and exported them and timed it. In all of those cases, the M1 Pro and the M1 Max performed very similarly, but they were both much, much faster than either the regular M1 from last year or uh, a slightly older Intel-based Mac, which you really can't get anymore outside of, I think, the 27-inch iMac and maybe one Mac Mini. So that was our initial round of testing when those MacBooks first came out. I've now gone back and done some more testing and brought in some more expert voices to help me understand the difference between the M1 Pro and the M1 Max. One of the first things I did was call in a uh, neighbor of mine from here in Brooklyn who's a VFX artist, works a lot in lighting actually, uh, and let him sit down and play with these two new systems. And he wanted to bring over a fairly heavy workload in a 3D program called Houdini. And we set that up and he had a fairly complex project. So we took that project and we rendered it. And even there on the M1 Pro and the M1 Max, we did not see a big difference, although they were much, much faster than the regular M1 because I ran the same workload on last year's 13 inch MacBook Pro, which is a regular M1 chip. So big difference there, not so much of a big difference in the actual rendering time. However, my neighbor said that using the app, it felt much more responsive with the M1 Max that was in the 16 inch MacBook Pro. So much so that when we were done with our demo session, he said, all right, now I'm ready to go out and buy a new MacBook Pro. I've been waiting for one of these and I'm gonna get the M1 Max and I'm pretty much gonna max out the 16 inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Max and the and the storage and the RAM. So, so he felt that in-app responsiveness was enough to say, definitely get the Max for him. But he's also a very high-end professional uh, much different than me or probably you. Then I went looking for more ways to test the graphics capabilities of these new Macs. And frankly, it's hard to do with gaming because as you know, there are not a ton of Mac games out there. And even the ones that they have, if there's a built-in benchmark on the Windows version, they don't have it on the Mac version. Or if you're using uh, a third-party frame rate counter to just keep an eye on the FPS, M1 breaks a lot of those, uh, not easy to do. So I went and ran a version of Geekbench that uses Metal, which is Apple's graphics API. And that actually was very handy. And there I was able to see a big difference between the M1 Max and the M1 Pro. And on top of that, a big difference between those two and a regular M1. So there's a pretty clear line of differentiation there. That test spits out you know, just, a, just a big number. And the higher the number is, the higher the score, the, the better the result. 
So the MacBook Pro 16 inch with the M1 Max, that got a score of about 65,000. Uh, the M1 Pro and the 14 inch MacBook Pro, that got about 42,000. And if you go back to a MacBook Pro 13 inch with the regular M1, that was about 21,000. So you could see a big difference there. The other pretty basic off the shelf test that seemed good to run was 3D Mark's Wildlife Extreme, which is now cross-platform in that you can run it on Windows systems, on Android, on iOS, but now you can run it on M1 Max, which is really interesting. Uh, the caveat there is they used Metal on the Max, but if you're comparing it to a Windows system, it uses, uh, I think, Vulkan there. So in that test, the M1 Max matched up almost exactly with really one of the most powerful uh, laptops that we've tested this past year, and that's a Razer Blade uh, 14 with a NVIDIA RTX 3080 card in it, and they ran that benchmark about the same. Right below that, I had a slightly older gaming laptop with an RTX 2080 in it, and just below that was the 14-inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Pro chip. And the nice thing about the test is you can go all the way down the list and see, you know, a regular MacBook Air or MacBook Pro with an M1, and you can even run it on your iPhone, and you can see there's, there's a huge performance difference between the, you know, Bionic chip and an iPhone and the M1 Max, and you can go all the way up the chain there and see what's going on. So I was finally able to find some points of differentiation between the M1 Pro and the M1 Max, but I had to go a little bit out of my way to do it outside of my normal workload and things that I usually do on a computer like this. So where does that leave us? There is a difference between the M1 Pro and the M1 Max, and you can find that difference and experience it, but it's really only in select cases. And sometimes the actual benchmark score or rendering time or something might be the same between the M1 Pro and the M1 Max, but that additional responsiveness within the app might make it worth upgrading from, let's say, the Pro to the Max in your specific case. You know, it really depends on your key applications and whether they rely more on the CPU or the GPU to do whatever it is they're gonna do. However, my advice remains for most people, including people like myself who just sort of dabble in creative projects. Again, I do a little Premiere video editing, I do some Photoshop, I do some 3D modeling. I'm fine with the regular M1 chip in a MacBook Air or in, let's say, the 24-inch iMac, like the one right behind me here. Uh, for a lot of people, that's still the right decision. If you're going to invest in one of these new MacBook Pros uh, with the higher end chips, remember that's gonna be expensive. $2,000 starts that could go up way past $6,000 depending on how you configure it. And if you have a job that's gonna pay for it or a client, the client work as a freelancer that makes it uh, you know, worthwhile to splurge on one of these, that's fantastic. This is the pro stuff that a lot of these people have been waiting for. Although some of those people are still waiting for something like a Mac Pro desktop with one of these new chips in it or the 27 inch iMac, which would be really cool to have with an M1 Pro or an M1 Max. But I still feel like that's the, that's the top end of the spectrum there. And for most everybody else, the mainstream slash semi-pro people like myself, you know, as I said in my 16 inch MacBook Pro review, if you wanna get one of these new MacBook Pros, primarily because you want the new cooler design, you want the better camera with a little cutout notch on the screen, you want the HDMI port and the SD card slot, or you just wanna have the newest, coolest, latest MacBook, totally cool, just be aware that you're making what is essentially a vanity purchase, and that's okay.